poetry of Kareem Tayyar, next on In Focus. And welcome to In Focus, a public affairs show that looks at newsmakers, events, and activities in and around Orange County. In Focus is produced by students enrolled in the Digital Media Arts program at Golden West College. I'm Warren Carter, host of In Focus. Joining me in the studio is Kareem Tayyar, Associate Professor of English at Golden West College, novelist, poet, and a diehard Laker fan. He is here today <laughs> to talk about and to read several poems from his latest book of poetry, Magic Carpet Poems. Welcome to In Focus. Thank you for having me, Warren. In this, in this reading, you're going to focus on cities, on, on cities. There's, there's five cities. It's Los Angeles, Portland. New York. New York, San Francisco. San Francisco. And there's... Yeah, what is the other one? <laughs> <laughs> there's five I of think them. there's... Is, uh, are there two LA ones, maybe? I know it's funny. <laughs> Why those cities, and, and why cities, and what's the, what's the story behind all that? Uh, well, there's, there's probably a few things. Uh, you know, with this collection, I was reading a lot of uh, nature poetry, um, you know, by writers like uh, uh, Walt Whitman, uh, Robert Frost, these kinds of writers. And, you know, one of the things that kept striking me was, you know, I, I love um, that genre of poetry, and yet I feel like the, the love a lot of those poets had for the, the kind of natural environment, um, I find myself feeling towards urban areas, um, specifically some of the cities that I spent a lot of my childhood in, whether that was Los Angeles. My, my, my mother's family is, is uh, kind of largely resides there. Um, my parents met in college in, in San Francisco, so we would go up there a lot when I was a kid. Um, and so I really kind of wanted to try to apply the same kind of, I don't know, celebratory kind of impulse that a lot of the kind of romantic nature poets um, employed on, the, on the, the kind of natural world and see if I could do the same thing for, for American urban spaces. The first poem read is uh, Fisherman's Wharf, San Francisco. And I, I asked you this earlier, so I'll ask you it again. When you, when you hear, when, you, when, when viewers hear, this, hear the poem, it has this nos nostalgic, it talks Definitely. about time gone past and, and gone by in, in Fisherman's Wharf. And I, as I read it, I thought, this is a young dude. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's like oh, well, you're an old soul reincarnated because you kind of like capture the essence of that, of what's gone by. Oh, that's kind of you to say. I mean, I, you know, I think there's a few things. I, my, my parents would take me to Fisherman's Wharf a lot when I was a really young kid. And then I didn't go to San Francisco for several years. And when I, when I went back for the first time as an adult, probably I think in my late 20s, I was struck by just how drastically it changed just in the 20 years since I'd, I'd been going there regularly. Um, and I, you know, I didn't think entirely for the better. I mean, that a lot of its kind of uni kind of uniqueness of spirit and character had been uh, kind of polished out, you know, or pushed out, um, which which happens so often in, in, in kind of American cities, right? The kind of gentr gentrification impulse, I guess, if you will. Um, I think that the second strand of nostalgia in a, in a poem like like the one you're referring to is, you know, I also always associate that city, especially with it's where my parents met when they were essentially, you know, 20, 19, 20 years old. Um, and so I think, you know, it may also be that I'm, I wasn't necessarily even seeing that city through the lens of my own kind of consciousness, but maybe my father's at that young age, and, and that takes me back then a couple more decades. Okay, let's, let's hear um, Fisherman's Wharf. The clouds lathered like a shaving cream upon the rugged face of sky. The moon a shaking hand with razor blade. The rain for rinsing age, it has gathered like regret around his mouth. This city like a father who has forgotten who he was. The man who never owned a three-piece suit now finds himself in black tie for his funeral. Say goodbye to all the local barber shops. The mother restaurants with recipes they carried on the boats. The cavern clubs of cords with young boys howling for their suppers. Say goodbye to the numbered union hall. The old man chess games popping timers like alarm clock. The cable cars that rambled like electric troubadours across the pothole pavements down to foggy seas. Say goodbye to the painted women that let you name them for an hour. The superhero bus stops where the ghosts of Iliad protected you from harm. The jazz men standing on the corners who slept inside the parks. I never thought this could happen to you, father. 
who sold your dignity for fortune and left your children with the bill. Three, two, one, floor. The, uh, the next poem, Second Faith, you talk about, again, Southern California, and you're talking about days gone by, but you're, you're an Orange County native the entire time? Yeah, so I, I was well, I was you know, I was born in, in, in Glendale in Los Angeles, uh, but yeah, I was born I was raised uh, entirely in Orange County. Um, but my mom had, had grown up in, in in Los Angeles, and you know my grandparents lived there, my aunts and uncles all lived there, and so I I spent a lot of time there as a kid, um, and as a teenager, and you know uh, even into my twenties. I mean I I spent an enormous amount of time there over the years, um, going to the museums, you know, going to see basketball games. Uh, going to Amoeba Records, Sunset Boulevard, these kinds of places. And so, um, you know, and I always think Los Angeles gets a really bad rap in a lot of respects, that it becomes this kind of walking cliche. Um, and, you know, I, I really wanted to combat some of that. I think, you know, Los Angeles has an enormous amount of great stuff to offer. And, and you know, I wanted to kind of capture that in this poem. Um, it's, it, it's dedicated to, to Jim Harrison, who was one of my kind of favorite poets and novelists. Um, and you know, so much of his work, like I'd mentioned earlier with, with Whitman is, and, and Frost, is, is kind of concerned with celebrating the natural landscape. And um, this was my version of trying to write a Harrison poem, but to kind of, uh, kind of take that kind of love of nature and kind of you know, uh, place, it, place it on the Los Angeles instead. Okay, let's hear it. A second faith. faith. Jim Harrison is writing about what he believes in. He's one of those old time wild men with his finger on the pulse of the raven and the oak tree and the river. He can tell time by the light of the sun and read the stars the way I might read a road map. And I keep thinking that he believes in the natural world the way I believe in the lobby at Union Station at five o'clock in the evening on a Thursday. And the sun has begun to filter through the windows and where the bellhops and the engineers and the brokers and the out of towners, the janitors and the would be starlets all hustle to make their trains for home. I believe in the sidewalk vendors selling bananas and lemonade. I believe in the tightrope majesty of the downtown telephone line, the young couple trying to hail a cab in the minutes before a sudden rainstorm, the game of stickball played on a suburban street, the wild circus of the Long Beach Pier when the waves are high and the water is warm and there is a boardwalk band bringing the replacements back to glorious life. I believe in the weekday baseball doubleheader at Angel Stadium the art walk pageant that is downtown Santa Ana on the final Tuesday of the month, the beauty of a police car siren burning down a rain-swept street. I believe in the neon of a film marquee when it's playing a film noir double feature. And I believe that, no matter what anyone says, dreams don't go to die in the modern city. It's where they go to be born again. And that poem seems to have given us like the opposite from Christian. <laughs> Bor and whereas you're, 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 you're lamenting the loss of, of that character, but here with your Los Angeles, that you know people with the dreams are coming here. Yeah, and you know I, I think that's one of the, the really kind of challenging things a lot of times when you're I, I probably when you engage in any kind of artistic kind of extended artistic pursuits is that you find that you're terribly inconsistent in terms of your <laughs> worldview. <laughs> You know, that, you know, you have the moment at Fisherman's Wharf where you wish, you know, things would go back to, to maybe the way they were at an earlier moment. And then there's times where you're in a different mood for whatever reason where you find that everything is perfect as it is at this moment. And I hope nothing ever changes. Um, and, you know, it is kind of a funny thing because I, I find myself, you know, I'll come back and, and look at some of the work I've written, you know, at, at a variety of points. And, and I'm struck by how, how much what I write is uh, dependent upon, you know, the particular mood I'm in at that moment. I think especially because you know I like to, I like to work pretty quickly. Um, the, uh, you know all all the, the poems I write, I, I write in a, in, a, in, a, in a sitting. You know, um, I, uh, I I sit, I write them, I read them, I edit them, all right there. You know, um, I never come back to them. Um, and so you know I've I've found that it, it I think it, at least hopefully my hope is that it gives them a sense of immediacy and, and kind of authenticity in, in a certain way, that it's, it's capturing what I'm feeling at a certain moment. Um, of course, the drawback, or you know, I don't know if I see it as a drawback, but the, the danger is that um, you know, I, I don't come back several days or a week or even months later with maybe a kind of changed perspective. I try to kind of let them stand on their own. The topical nature of some of your poems, do you feel that 
that that can be a positive or a negative and in, in, in dating the poem or oh, as we were talking about question. in previous show about Susan not knowing who Merle Haggard was or uh, you you talk about the the in Long Beach the um the the, the roller coaster cyclone, the roller cyclone, cyclone coaster, yeah. and you and you mentioned it. so you feel that that could lose some relevancy by being so topical. Yeah, that's time. that's a very real danger, and you know, and I'm sure that's the case. Um, you know, the way I've always kind of thought about it is, you know, so many of the writers that have meant a lot to me who are far more talented than I that I would ever be. But you know, I think about a writer like Hemingway, um, and and how often he used kind of plays on proper names, and that you know he, he found a real kind of sanctity in that. Um, that you know what you were doing by using those kinds of, uh, of specific details and names was really kind of situating your characters within. A specific historical moment. Um, the danger is, you're right. It's going to kind of maybe lock the work into a, a particular moment or space of time. But at the same time, you know, when, as we talked about in the previous show, when I'm, I'm worried that at times we forget too easily, um, the hope is that you know the poems become a kind of archive, you know, um, that you can kind of keep coming back to, to to calling up some of those 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 places and and, and people that are lost as time passes. So I, I have to ask you, having said that, then then. Coming soon to pen and paper is the O to the Sports Center. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? I, I know that probably is. I mean, it, it, and it, it is kind of amazing that it, it seems like, you know, uh, as, as our kind of culture gets faster, you know, on a daily basis, that you're right, things, things emerge and, 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 and kind of shine forth for a while and vanish so much more quickly even than they used to. I mean, you're, you're talking about Sports Center, it's peaking <laughs> eight years ago, and, and now it seems like it's. It's not the. It doesn't have the cultural relevance it may have had even less than a decade ago. Or the, um, or in Los Angeles, the, um, the sports arena. That's what. I, that's yeah, what the oh, the sport, That's. It, I'm sorry. That I've is been. coming. <laughs> it's it's funny you mention that too because uh, you know we had, we had spoken earlier. I, you know I, I, I was at a uh, I, I saw Bruce Springsteen a few times on, uh, uh, about a month ago on his uh, the River Tour, and the shows were at the sports arena and they were the last shows before the, the sports arena was getting torn down and. I devastated me. I thought it was so sad that you know, even if it's even if it's maybe no longer a, a building in its prime, it's it's our building, you know. And and I hate to see it go. I'm one of them. Can't wait to see it go. <laughs> I don't think we're the only one. I have a feeling I'm probably in the minority on that. You know. So are you also going to write an ode to Runyon Canyon? That's a really good question. Yeah, that may be right. One of these next books. <laughs> we'll have to put a list together. <laughs> we're going to leave the West Coast. We're going to go over to the East Coast. And uh, that's one of the recurring themes of your through your poetry has been you know, the effect Walt Whitman yeah. has had. Talk about Walt Whitman and his effect with you in uh, the New York uh, elegies. I mean, it's almost impossible, and you know, I, I know I'm not alone in this, but it's almost impossible to kind of overstate just how much his work has meant to me. I mean, I, I think you know, in so many respects, American poetry begins with him. Um, you know, uh, that you know, in so many ways. I, I get the sense that where our, where our country so often kind of fails politically, um, Whitman's work kind of represents a democratic spirit of America at its best. Um, his ability to kind of celebrate difference and diversity and a variety of cultures and to see America as being strengthened by that um, and made whole by that um, is something that, I mean, I, I don't know if, uh, I can't think of any other writer who's done that quite as beautifully. Um, that taken with the fact that, you know, he writes in such an accessible style that he has a real lyrical quality about him, um, but at the same time, you feel like you're hearing uh, an authentic voice. Um, it doesn't seem like a voice that's been too polished or too sanitized. Um, and so, yeah, you know, Whitman shows up in a very real way in this in, in the New York elegy poem, um, or largely because you know when I went to New York for the first time, I couldn't help but think at a variety of moments, you know, wondering if Whitman was ever on the streets or if he was ever in this particular space, and if he was, what he might have thought about it. Let's hear uh, New York elegy. I saw the ghost of Whitman bathing in Bethesda Square, the mounted beat cops directing traffic on a moonless Manhattan night, the St. Mark's Street Queen stalking rainbows with a poet's flair. There were treasures hidden everywhere, the bikini beauties tending bar and trading verses with the travelers down in Tyne. I saw the ghost of Whitman bathing in Bethesda Square. From the top of Rockefeller Center, you could have combed the starlight's lovely hair seen the children blessing tired parents with their laughter on a perfect April night, the St. Mark's Street Queen stalking rainbows with a poet's flair. It was almost more than I could bear. To be without you as the birds in Central Park took flight. I saw the ghost of Whitman bathing in Bethesda Square. Each night I would climb the hotel's winding stair and dream of you with all my might. The St.
St. Mark's Street Queen stalking rainbows at a public square. Your passing is proof that life has never failed. That even those we love will vanish faster than the speed of light. I saw the ghost of Whitman Bathing in Bethesda Square. The St. Mark's Street Queen stalking rainbows at a public square. We're good. Moving so we get all the five of them in here. <laughs> I could move to jump to the next one. And this is the, the one that we talked to a folk earlier. As I said before, your, your style up until this point has been clear and precise. <laughs> and it was like, okay, I, I know what he's saying. I know what he's talking about. Then this one, um, July 3rd, Portland. Uh -huh. um, and I, I, I must have read it seven times. I just, I said, I just got to ask them, okay, what's going on in Portland? <laughs> so funny, yeah. You know, it, it, that's always such an interesting thing, too, that, you know, um, <laughs> What, how you think a reader is going to respond to your work and how a reader actually does. You know, that's always an interesting thing. Um, so the, the genesis for this poem was, you know, I have a, a, a two very close friends, a, a husband and wife who live in Portland. And I'd gone up to visit them a, a few years ago um, before they were married. Um, and uh, we kind of started our fireworks celebration a day early. And, um, you know, it was, it was the three of us and a number of their friends from up in the area um, that just kind of turned the street for a short amount of time into a, you know, a little kind of fireworks a uh, kind of home base, and um, it was a really beautiful moment. I, you know, I remember being up there. It was at a, a kind of moment of transition in my life as well, kind of realizing that you know this was a really kind of special moment that was probably marking the end of one chapter of my life and moving into another. And um, so I, I, you know, I, I remembered kind of being in that moment, trying to kind of archive so much of what I was seeing around me, um, so I wouldn't forget it. And so that's the genesis for the poem. Let's hear it. July third in Portland. I'll remember how we all ran out into the middle of the street to see the bangle of a silver moon float above the pine trees that stood silent as ghosts all along the sidewalk. The small flames from sparklers still flickering in our excited hands. Our breath smelling of the homemade pizza we had just finished eating. The porch filled with the empty cans of Coke and beer and someone's camera and someone else's shoes and the door to the house half open. And the cat sleeping on the rooftop like an angel and the children playing up the street, and the vintage truck parked on the lawn two doors down that was painted with purple flames and a green and yellow hood. I'll remember someone saying how beautiful it looked, and the way one of us stretched out our arms to embrace everything that we could never hold, and how someone said there were cars coming, and that the night was starting to get cold. Okay, now that you gave me the story. <laughs> <laughs> Last poem, it's, it, I think it's perfect when May com uh, comes completely you know, uh, 360 degrees. And it's looking back at your, your hometown, Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and you talk about uh, imagining my city. So this poem it kind of is born out of, I have, my, my grandfather was a, a surveyor in downtown Los Angeles for you know, 40 plus years. And when I was a kid, he would take me on these great walks all over the city. And he seemed to have a story for every place that we walked by. Um, and I think that was probably what first triggered my love or inspired my love for Los Angeles. Um, it also created a really kind of romantic lens through which I always saw the city. Um, even as I got older and kind of realized that, you know, I, I couldn't quite see it as romantically as that, that, you know, it, it was a city just like any city with its own kind of problems and tensions and, and, and difficulties. Um, and yet, uh, I've never been entirely able to let go of that first kind of childhood love of the city and thinking that it is a, it is a place where dreams can kind of come true and that um, it, it can be a kind of ideal utopian space of seeing, what's that Hunter Thompson line, through the right set of eyes, you know? And so that's, that's kind of what, uh, where this, the, the genesis of this poem in a certain respect. So imagining my city. In Los Angeles, we are painting passages from the Song of Solomon on the freeway billboards all across the 405. We are zoning empty parking lots as landing strips for flying saucers. Graffiti artists are writing poems on the walls of long demolished hotels. The ambassador resurrected as a multi-floored, previously unpublished page from Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. And everywhere we are singing the songs of Sunset Boulevard prostitutes, of transvestites roller skating through the aisles of the Our Lady of the Angels Church of carpenters constructing the outdoor stage at the end of the miracle mile that will bring Robert Kennedy back to life, of Old Testament quoting street police who will bring the Black Dahlia's killer to justice, of Crips and Bloods who will put flowers into the barrels of one another's guns, 
of the counter lady at the time travel mart in Echo Park who will tell you what vacation spots you have to hit in the now vanished 20th century if you only have three days to spend in that shadow land of Fargo. Of streetcar operators who wheel their water powered trains up the hill to Angel's Flight by invoking Allah's name and Mother Mary's saintly goodness. John Lennon would have understood. You have to imagine the world you want to live in and then make sure it is a world where everyone is welcome. Would there be a postscript to that with the renovation or rebirth of lo downtown Los Angeles? I think so in some respects, yeah. You know, it's, it's one of the things that I think is so beautiful about Los Angeles is that every time you think in some respects <laughs> that it's, it's on the ropes, it seems to kind of punch its way out of the corner. And, you know, I think that's certainly been the case for the last several years. You know, I'm really struck by when you go and spend time in downtown, um, how it seems to be so kind of revitalized and reanimated in ways that I didn't think were previously possible. I agree. It's, we could go on and on, Paul, but I mean, it has just been amazing. The book Magic Carpet Poem is available from Amazon.com. The poet, Kareem Tyler, a fresh contemporary poet that speaks to the heart, mind, and soul of us all. Thank you for sharing your poem and your insight with us on Invoke. Thank you for having me.